Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Linda Shelton, the Executive Director of the Joyce Theater. Founded in 1982, the Joyce Theater is considered one of the premier performance venues for dance. Its mission is to support the art of dance and choreography and enhance public appreciation of dance, music, design, and theater. Linda has generously agreed to share some of her experience with us. I'd like to thank you, Linda, for joining us today. Thank you for inviting me. Dance is so wonderful. It's a three-dimensional art. It's an art of music. It's an art of motion. It's an art of physicality. It's an art of image. Talk about the importance of dance to our society today. Well, it's everybody, or I'd say most people, actually have a body and they move, and it's just part of our everyday life. It's, um, I think, uh, something that should be more embraced by everyone, everyone living. And um, I think sometimes it gets a bad rap because people say they don't understand it. So they might not get involved in it or embrace it from the concert dance point of view. And you occupy, as a presenting organization, you occupy a fairly unique space within the ecosystem of, of performing arts presenters. Talk about the Joyce Theater, its genesis, and the programs that you do present. Yes, the Joyce has a very interesting beginning. It was founded and built by a former choreographer, Elliot Feld, a uh, former dancer, and his executive director, Cora Khan. And they came up with the idea because Elliot Feld's dance company needed an affordable, right-sized place to perform in Manhattan. And the idea was, we'll create this for his dance company and then make it available, make the model available for every dance company that wants to perform. And here. when you when you design the space, you had to take the specific needs of dancers into account and choreographers. Absolutely, and that was a big part of the design, of course. Elliot Feld wanted it made in a particular way that suited his company, but that works for all dance companies. And uh, people love the floor. The floor was very carefully thought out. I actually have a very funny story about um, we've had Savion Glover at the tap dancer at the Joyce many times. And he was playing Broadway at one point, and I got a call from the producers, and they said, tell me what your secret is. <laughs> Savion will, loves the floor at the Joyce Theater. He said, it's, it keeps his feet warm. What do you do? And so I knew the answer, but I said, I, I really can't share that. It's you know trade secret. Well, what happens is our our clothes dryer had been venting underneath the stage. <laughs> There's an awful lot of lint as a result of that, but it kept, it keeps the dancers' feet warm. So talk about your programming on an annual basis. Who do you end up presenting? And what is the process yeah. that, that you, you employ to get to those very difficult decisions? Well, the Joyce has a very robust season at its main theater in Chelsea. And there we have 48 weeks of dance, and it runs the gamut. From 48 weeks. So that yes. is that in and of itself is very unusual. It is. It is. We're probably one of the only presenters in the world that has that many weeks of activity, one right after the other. But I guess we didn't think that was enough, because now we're presenting in other venues outside of our own. We present small-scale programs all around New York. and smaller venues than the Joyce. And then more recently, we took advantage of an opportunity at Lincoln Center. And we noticed there were no presenters of the very, very large scale, mostly ballet companies that tour the United States but skip over New York. And so now the Joyce is presenting at Lincoln Center at the David H. Koch Theater. That's phenomenal. That's just yes. phenomenal. And how many audience members uh, get the opportunity on an annual basis to attend Joyce performances? It's roughly about 135,000 that come to all the venues. 135,000. Yeah. And, and what is your audience constellation? If you take a look at the demographics of your audience, young to old? It's really mixed. It's m really mixed. And a lot of company, a lot of audience members follow a particular company, and they are diehard fans of that company. A lot of our audience a good core of it, 20, 30 percent, will come and see absolutely everything that we do. And I know my colleagues would say that subscriptions are down, and I would agree with that. But we have audience members that buy, you know, 10, 12 dance companies. Mm. 
they don't consider themselves subscribers, but you know, they come that many times over a season. And now with these new audiences at Lincoln Center, that's a whole different dance audience that we haven't tapped into yet, and we're very excited to do that. So you have the, the hub facility yes. in Chelsea, and yes. then you have 11 smaller venues, and now you've added the, uh, the, um, the Lincoln Theater, uh, the, the Lincoln Center yes. uh, uh, venue. Yes. So you're actually, you actually go from being a centralized organization to being more of a hub and spoke situation. That has changed your management. It has. Uh, in, in, it in has, but it's the basic skill set to present. You know, the differences are you don't control the weeks as much, but it's still the same skill set. You're still selecting a company. You're still doing the marketing. There's still production elements that need to be taken care of. It's just on a much larger scale. And you presented over 270 different companies? At least, yes, yes. And we do a lot of international work as well. We think that uh, because our mission is so broad that um, an audience member can get an education on all dance if they come to a full season of ours. So talk about that international work. Is it, is it presenting um, U.S. companies overseas? It is presenting overseas companies or, or international companies here? Well, we mostly present companies in our venues. Right. However, there is a network of dance presenters from all over the world, and we often talk with our colleagues in Europe or Asia about what we're presenting and vice versa. So you become a, a way to share intelligence on the companies here for yes. those presenters overseas. Absolutely, yes. And then you are inviting uh, presenters here uh, to, to your venues uh, in New York. Yes. And I understand that you've also um, uh, become part of the international diplomacy around uh, Cuba. Yes, we have. We have a travel program. We uh, take friends of the Joyce Theater all over the world to see dance, like many organizations do, but our niche is to see dance. And Cuba presented a wonderful opportunity because dance is so prevalent there, dance and music. We've been going since 1999. And over these years, we've developed relationships. And a few years ago, things started to change in Cuba a little bit, whereby a private business was allowed. And a few choreographers thought, this is an opportunity. I can start my own company. So there is one company that just started, and we've been helping them. They don't have the financial wherewithal to hire a choreographer. And that's one thing they're really lacking in Cuba, because they've been so isolated. They, you know, the dancers are exquisitely trained. They just don't have choreographers there. So we've brought two choreographers to Cuba to make new work and then presented it at the Joyce Theater. In terms of managing this organization that has evolved so significantly over the years, uh, you have a series of challenges. You have a situation in which you're trying to encourage a diverse audience to attend your performances. You're trying to afford choreographers and other artists the artistic license to, to do new work. How do you keep yourself fresh? Well, one of the things that I think is extremely helpful is affordability. It's part of our mission to keep our ticket price as affordable as we possibly can. And what does that translate into? Well, we have a $10 ticket, a $20 ticket, and then it goes up from there. There are some audience members that can certainly afford a $50 or $60 ticket. But I think what it means is that audience members are willing to experiment, and they don't always love everything. I hear about it when they don't, and some of the things that we program, we know they're not going to sell tickets. We program it intentionally to bring something new in something different, and that's what keeps it fresh. I mean, we do serve as a home for many of the New York companies, and they need to develop as artists and continue to hone their craft over the years, so you don't want to exclude them in exchange for something brand new. Uh, but I think the mix of all of these things on the season, I mean, we say it's the, you know, the time-honored, like the Martha Graham company, or someone like that, and the untried. Well, I say less tried, but you know, it's, it's just an opportunity. With 500 seats, I think you can take a kind of risk that maybe you can't. And we have to be prepared that 
in some cases, we, we won't have a sellout, but maybe the next time we will. How do you assure that the organization remains an organization that is able to promote creation, the new, the edgy, and frankly, some of those efforts are going to fail? How do you assure that? Well, I have, I have a lot to say about that because I think about this a lot. So first of all, I'm very lucky because the Joyce Board understands that the programming is left up to the professional staff. And they're very good about allowing us to do our jobs. And they understand that maybe some of the things that they liked early in their lives may not be relevant anymore. Uh, but I think they all have pretty open minds. We're also lucky that the way we do our recruiting is from the audience. So if they're already coming to see things, we know that they have an open mind. We usually look at people who have been to the theater over many years or at least had a very, a very varied events, you know, that they come and see. And we have a, you, you'd think we were adopting them because we have a pretty long recruitment cultivation period. We want to make sure they're the right people for us and that they're not stuck in their ways and that they're, they're open to what the Joyce's mission is. I mean, that's the first thing. They really have to believe in the mission and that is very inclusive. And there are a couple that, you know, stick to some of the more conservative things we present. But, you know, as, as long as we can make it work financially, then, um, you know, it, it's really wide open. You provide a, a series of programs for, for very young people. You have an education program. Yes, we do. Uh, talk about your partnership with the school system. Here. Yes, well, we have, um, it's more than an exposure program. We bring schools in to see performances at the Joyce. As a matter of fact, there were 500 children uh, leaving the building when I did just a little while ago. And before they come, they're visited by a teaching artist over the course of the semester. And they learn about the art form from various entry points. Sometimes it's part of the curriculum. It might be through geography if it's an international company. Sometimes it's about the movement itself. Sometimes it's about imagination. So lots of ways to enter it. And it's a very popular program. And we just have to be careful, you know, that we don't put anything in front of the kids that, you know, might not be appropriate for that age level. Of course. Because it is K through 12. Now, your career has actually been, it, it has spanned quite a number of experiences in the dance world. How did you get involved in, in the dance world? I studied dance growing up for a long time. And when it came time to go to college, I, I got a degree in dance and then tried to figure out what to do next. <laughs> At about that time, the arts administration programs were just starting to take hold. Mm -hmm. So I went back for, I started a master's at NYU in arts administration. And part of it was to do an internship. I went to the New York State Council on the Arts. I was working in the dance program there. And uh, toward the end of that internship, choreographer Twyla Tharp came in for her annual meeting and right. mentioned that she was going to start growing a staff. and I raised my hand. I said, I'd love to be part of that. And I was hired. And it was my first job working for a choreographer. And I was willing to do anything and everything. And so that's, that was the beginning of it. And I had a wonderful experience. You know, sometimes Twyla has a, a reputation for being tough. But yes. for me, it was an exceptional learning experience. And then you went on to the Joffrey? Eventually, yeah, I did a few other things when Twyla folded her company into American Ballet Theater at that time, and then uh, went to the Joffrey, which is a company I grew up watching, so that was very, very close to my heart. And, and then, so, then and the Joyce position opened up, right. yeah, and I thought, I've been preparing myself for this. I know what a dance company wants when they come to a theater, and I think I have a good handle on that. So I was able to convince them over 20 years ago. And over the last uh, period of time, you've actually evolved still further into becoming a producing organization. Yes. Um, one thing that we've learned is that the dance field in general is undercapitalized, yes. under-resourced, and it's very difficult to raise money for 
you know, a very small dance company. So we felt that we needed to get involved in the producing end of it, whether it's providing affordable rehearsal space, whether it's helping a choreographer by adding an outside eye to the process, certainly financial support. We do a lot of commissioning, you know, pretty much a cash grant to help things get started, seed money or finances along the way. We also have an artist in residence who this year happens to be Twyla Tharp, um, and that allows them to have a home for a couple of years or um, at least a few months. And yeah. access to a facilities, an experimental yes. space, the mm -hmm. interactions being in the center of all this performance and in the center of, the, uh, of, of these different companies and different sensibilities, that in and of itself informs the creative process. Absolutely, yes. It's interesting to watch an organization build an ecosystem like this. There is such a truism out there that you have proved to be untrue. The truism is that, that opera, dance are dying arts. You have taken that truism and challenged it and indeed expanded the, the form in this geography, uh, certainly, with a, w w with a truly international impact. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's so refreshing to, uh, to, to see. Do you have any advice for other leaders, other arts leaders, performing arts leaders, in particular dance leaders? Yeah, well, again, it gets back to that relationship with the board. I mean, I feel like they're my partners in this, and they trust me to lead, and they have to come along for the ride, and sometimes you know, I have to ask them for extra support when we're trying something new. Um, but I don't think we could do what we're doing without that support. And I think as a, you know, along the same lines, funders also trust us. Some of the larger institutional funders see what we're up to and see that we're responsible and that we, the ideas we come up with usually work out, not always, but you know, they trust that we're gonna do what we say we're gonna do with any kind of grant that we would get. And, and I was going to, to say that trust actually comes from some place. It comes from type management. Mm -hmm. it, it comes from attention to detail. It does. It comes from an understanding of the mission, but also being able to communicate how a particular investment, which will, in many cases, by definition, be risky, yes. how that risk attaches to artistic value, mission value that justifies that type of risk taking. Absolutely. And, and, and until one has the language to do that and, and creates the consensus surrounding that, you're at risk because your, your support ends up being shallow. What do you think the, the secret is to creating that kind of an environment which, which incubates and is exciting and is engaging? Is it a matter of of marketing? Uh, is it a matter of communication? Is it a matter of who you recruit to be on your board? I think it's all of that. And I, I, I think you can't do that. You can't get away with these things as a brand new leader. I think it takes time to develop that trust. Credibility. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, a good example is when I went to the board and said, there's an opportunity at Lincoln Center, and maybe the joy should start presenting there. And at first, they, you know, I could hear them, is she crazy? Why do we want to do that? And what will that cost? And we don't want to jeopardize what we do. And how does that fit into our mission? And I said, look, if we can raise the money for it with your help, you know, let, let's do this. And of course, the first time out, you know, it added $2 million to our budget like that, you know, overnight. Uh, but it was such an exhilarating and thrilling experience that we said, okay, Let's see if we can do this. Let's make a three-year commitment and see how this works out. And so we'll, you know, we'll evaluate it when we're finished with this three-year period and see if it's the right thing for us. And then course correct. And so it's Absolutely. always a work in process. Absolutely. You can't take any of it for granted. Do you view yourself as a type of choreographer? That's an interesting question. I guess so. You're always... I, it's to me, it's more like maneuvering. <laughs> I wouldn't say it's choreography. Maybe if I added music, I could. <laughs> <laughs> well, Linda Shelton, thank you so much for sharing your experience at the Joyce Theater, and thank you so much for sharing your insights. Thank you very much.